everyone, my name is Kim and welcome back to Bookmarks and Breadsticks. Hi and welcome back to Bookmarks and Breadsticks. If you're new to my channel, my name is Kim and I love to focus on everything food bookish related, sometimes called culinary nonfiction. My battery on my camera is now dying, so we'll be right back. Okay, we're back with a fresh new battery, ready to go. Oh, the joys of being a booktuber sometimes, right? I am here today to bring you a book duo. When you think of food, you probably think of the lovely, delicious eating experience. You're thinking of your favorite dessert, your favorite meal. I'm here today to talk to you about poison. So I'm here today to talk to you about food and poison within the culinary world. First book I want to talk about is from Carolyn Cobalt, and this is a rainbow palette. First off, this cover is so cool. Big thank you to Rakuten Books and the University of Chicago Press for sending me this review copy. And then the other is The Poison Squad, One Chemist's Single-Minded Crusade for Food Safety at the Turn of the 20th Century by Deborah Blum. Also a pretty wickedly cool cover. If you hear any scratching off camera, I apologize. It is kitty playtime this morning, but we're just gonna let her have her own moment over there. So, poison in food. I should give some context that both of these books in terms of timelines take place more towards the beginning of the 1900s and in the late 1800s about the introduction of synthetic ingredients into the food world. Rainbow Palette, How Chemical Dyes Changed the West's Relationship with Food, takes a more global approach. The Poison Squad focuses on one chemist, Dr. Wiley, and his crusade in the United States to put the consumer first and get clear ingredient labels and safety precautions put in place. So first, where do most synthetic dyes come from? They Synthetic dyes actually originate from like the fabric world. Think dyeing clothes for the first time. These were huge innovations when they came out in the 1800s and even further back. Those dyes changed colors. They're from, they're derivative of coal tar, which already you're like, ew, there's coal tar in my food. There was. Coal tar was helping to change and introduce new colors to the world. Purple was one of the first big breakthroughs when it came to that kind of chemistry. And along the way, people got curious and just thought, well, if this dye is purple, can I add this purple color to a food to make it more appealing, more alluring? And it's all a marketing ploy. It is all a sales ploy. And it very quickly became a way to hide and disguise subpar food. An example of this is using red dye to make your beef still look good. That could be that beef might be going rancid, it has a short shelf life, or it's an unsavory cut that they are putting and calling something else. It's, um, it's a sirloin and I'm calling it filet mignon, etc. So the rainbow palette really takes a look at it from a global perspective. This is heavily science-based. This is not gonna give you a narrative in any way, and I thought it was very informative. It's, a it's not a book you're gonna breeze through. I definitely had to take it chapter by chapter. A brief synopsis. The Rainbow Palette examines how chemists in Europe and the United States maneuvered themselves to become instrumental players in new regimes of food production, regulation, and quality testing. And as increasing industrialization, international trade, and competition led to the mounting concerns about food adulteration, manufacturers, politicians, and the public all invoked chemists to represent their interests. So this book really focuses on the role of the chemist. The chemist actually wasn't that thrilled that big manufacturers were starting to put dyes in food. They, they all kind of raised their hand and went, wait, I've only tested it in this area. Like I haven't tested it on food. I don't think you should do that yet. Like I need time to study. And all the manufacturers were like, nah, I wanna make money now. And just kind of ran away with it. What would happen later is that these chemists would be brought into court to either defend the manufacturer or to defend, you know, the consumer relations who are concerned about what's going on. And all the chemists, it was a very interesting place for them to be put in, a 
quite a predicament, if you will, because they wanted to do the research, but some chemists also saw this as an opportunity to become salaried, to get paid a lot more money than they were as just plain chemists. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting debate and paradigm that these conflict that these chemists would go through. I think one of my favorite examples that the book opens with is the visual of the, is it a unicorn or a regular horse in The Wizard of Oz? That horse is actually colored pink with uh, jello instant jello powder because, um, because well, PETA was not going to let you die, spray dye, you know, airbrush a horse. Um, so they used <laughs> the jello and they say that if you look, look at the video, you can see the, the movie, you can see the horse like trying to lick off the dye because it's, it's sugar, essentially. It's a sugar product. But this was a really illuminating, cautionary kind of tale of how people, societies took these dyes from a different area of the world, textiles, manufacturing, and added it to our food without really understanding what the hazards or long-term impact were going to be. And it's a very detailed book. It's a very scientific book. I think if you have a chemistry background, you will appreciate this book far more than I did. There were definitely times where they were breaking down compounds and it was just way over my head, but it is a really interesting understanding of how fast moving science was in the field. It's not that science isn't fast moving. Science is always fast moving, but the science was moving so fast for the chemists, they weren't able to conduct those long-term studies without someone snatching up the idea and inserting it into the food product, like food manufacturing world. I think the back blurb sums up this book perfectly. A rainbow palette is an illuminating cautionary tale of how an important unintended consequence of cutting edge science can work itself into the very fabric of our daily lives without a clear plan on anyone's part. That is the perfect way to describe this book. It feels like organized chaos. Everyone's trying to use these dyes for their own gains. Even the, even the scientists and the chemists want you know, to be paid well, they want their moments of fame, but they're also like, I don't know what this is going to do to people. And where food was showing up was in some really dangerous places. Well, it was dangerous everywhere, but it was showing up in milk and in confectionaries. And you know who had, who was eating a lot of that? Children, a lot of children died um, because no one was testing this kind of stuff. So the Rainbow Palette took a look focusing specifically in Europe, the role of chemical dyes and how it changed the West's relationship with food. The Poison Squad is all about the United States. This has much more of a narrative story because you are just following one chemist's single-minded crusade. His name is Dr. Wiley. His full name, excuse me, is Dr. Harvey Washington Wiley. So what is a good example of tons of, let's call them artificial additives? Have you ever, it's now defunct, but on Bon Appetit, they used to have this series called Gourmet Chef Mix. And Claire Saffitz would read the ingredients on the back of the item that she was going to recreate, like Twinkies. And this, the editor, oh my God, Vinny was such a good editor. He is still a good editor. He would fill the screen with every single ingredient. And it was alarming that you could see something like a Twinkie have 30 different ingredients, many of them different corn derivatives. Right. Ingredient wise, we have bleached enriched wheat flour, sugar, corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup, animal and vegetable shortening, tallow, hydrogenated tallow, cottonseed oil, mono and diglyceride, polysorbate 60, dextrose, calcium carbonate, calcium sulfate, agar, eggs, that's good, water, disodium phosphate, locust bean gum, modified corn starch, corn syrup solid, soy lecithin, sodium acid, pyrophosphate, natural and artificial flavors, enzymes, yellow 5, red 40. The end. Let's go back to the end of the 1800s into the 1900s. We have someone like Dr. Wiley, who is very concerned about what these ingredients are, what they do to our bodies, and he puts together the Poison Squad. The Poison Squad is a group of grown, healthy men that sign up for a series of scientific tests where they are essentially given poison in their meals, and some are given some of the participants are given placebo, some are given the poisons, and some in other studies, they are given poisons in different doses throughout this period and experiments. And from what I understood in the book, no one actually quite died, but there were definitely studies where people couldn't finish the study because they were getting so ill, they were taken out of trials. And Dr. Wiley's work really helped to set 
a lot of the first foundationary government policies that helped keep us as consumers safe. Here's a really good example. Remember how I mentioned earlier that you could, at the time, preserve, you wanted your meat to look good at the counter, you wanted it to last longer? We used formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is used to embalm people. They were putting formaldehyde in milk. And when the manufacturers fought against Dr. Wiley saying, why is it such a big deal? His response was, do you want to embalm the baby? First off, I want a movie just so I can watch someone say that line because it's such a good line. It's such an OG, like, yeah, awesome. <laughs> Sorry, I was like very, I chuckled when I read that line. But that's what I mean. Adultering food to make them better for shelf life purposes, to sell off less quality items at the expense of harming the general public. In 1906, Dr. Wiley is credited for being the real father behind the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act. And across the land, it is known as Dr. Wiley's Law. The Clean Food and Drug Act was the first step at really monitoring and setting standards for how to keep the consumer safe. The problem with this piece of legislation was that there were no standards in quantities that could be reinforced. So if the rule said food adulteration only by 10%, what does that mean? 10% formaldehyde? Can I put 10% formaldehyde? And that's what the manufacturers would do. They would poke holes at these loopholes. And Dr. Wiley also threw out many different, he works for the government for 25 years. He goes through multiple presidents and different presidents, different, um, the food and agriculture boards, they all have different priorities. And you really get to see how toxic, haha, toxic the government can be because there are loyalties to large manufacturers that really try to undermine all of Dr. Wiley's work. And all Dr. Wiley wants to do is make sure people are safe. There are times where they, people poke at Dr. Wiley throughout this book and say, is this just your personal vendetta or do you actually care about people? And sometimes, oh my gosh, guys, the stuff that people tried to get away with. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell you strawberry jam. It's got corn syrup, apple peels, and red dye. Does that sound like strawberry jam to you? No. Or honey was just corn syrup with dye. Maple syrup, corn syrup with dye. Injecting my meat with tons of red dyes to make it look like it's going to last longer. When it's not cow meat, it's horse meat. Yeah, that kind of stuff. There is, the book is fascinating. It was so much fun to read. It really captured my attention. And eventually Dr. Wiley actually leaves the government to work for uh, Good Housekeeping. And I don't know if you guys have seen those seals of like Good Housekeeping seals on certain products. And it's basically a way for Wiley to get out of the government because he just feels like everyone's personally against him. And because of his reputation as being not that flexible. He didn't want to give any manufacturer an inch because then if he gave, made concessions to the whiskey industry, for example, he'd have to make it somewhere else. And that made him gain the reputation of being very stubborn or inflexible. So he moved on to good housekeeping. But what the book only hints on, but we don't get a lot of, is the role of women's parties and consumer parties who work side by side with Wiley saying, my children are sick. My children are dying. I gave them candy and they died. And these women's groups would write to, con they would write to Congress, they would write to Senate, they would write to the president directly and say, do something, our children are dying. That was only touched upon. I wish we had gone to a little bit more detail, but that could be a whole other book in itself. The Poison Squad, what really at the heart of it is fascinating is Dr. Wiley's decision to make an actual Poison Squad board, to actually start those chemical trials, those um, consumer testing to really understand the impact of these dangerous ingredients, some of which are still in existence today. Thankfully, formaldehyde is not in our food. We are not embalming babies. But in conclusion, I have to say both of these books were super wonderful to read, but just wonderful in different ways. The Rainbow Palette is much more of a science chemistry focused book, a little less on narrative, but very historical. Really nice to have this foundational understanding. Thank you again, Rakuten Books and University of Chicago Press for sending this to me. The Poison Squad really focuses on the United States. It definitely has a little bit more of a narrative because you're following Dr. Wiley's life. The two together, I think, are great founda foundational books that I want everyone to read or at least read a chapter or two out of so that you can understand to what's in your food today. 
what you should be turning around your ingredient labels to understand what things are. Now, some of those larger multi-syllable words are not actually bad ingredients. They're sometimes processing agents that don't even make their way into food or it's a fancy word to say another corn derivative, which we shouldn't be eating that much corn in general, but I digress. I hope these books interest you, but also make you maybe realize we could be more aware of what we are letting into our food system and what we're letting into our own bodies. I will have links for both of these books in the description below. And if you haven't already, I would love for you to hit like and subscribe. So what do you think about my newest book duo? Would you ever imagine a world where you could embalm a baby? I sure didn't, but it was a fascinating read. Thankfully, we're way past that. I hope you're well. Hit subscribe. I'll see you in the next video. And oh, don't forget, sorry, I'm wearing the 2021 Independent Bookstore Day t-shirt. Independent Bookstore Day is at the end of April where you can support your independent bookstores. Now remember, if you are in a city in lockdown, you're not comfortable going to a bookstore, you can still support your bookstores by purchasing books online. Think ahead. Mother's Day's coming. Buy your mom a book. Father's Day's coming. Buy your dad a book. Get someone special in your life. Buy him a book. Or you could do what I do, which is I pre-bought Christmas books months ago. I buy people their books way in advance as gifts, and I don't feel bad about it. But remember, you can always support your independent bookstore or the links in my bio where I link to these different books. I will always link through bookshop.org. Bookshop.org is a great alternative to buying books on Amazon. They are a platform where 10% of your purchase will always go back to independent bookstores. I do receive a small commission, but it's like 1% of the purchase versus 10% of the purchase always goes to the bookstore. I find their shipping, I always pay for ground shipping four to five days. They are always prompt, they are always on time, and they do have all of those new books you guys are looking for, or the books from Book of the Month, or a book like, for example, totally outside my normal genre, but Accidentally Engaged by Farah Heron. I have seen a lot of booktubers talking about this book. I got it on bookshop.org. Support your independent bookstores. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.